only difference is I don't have a bow tie on. <laughs> It's good to be here this morning with you folks. Good to have Brother Herb, Sister June, and their family here. Brother Herb has taught me over the years the truth of God's Word, and I've always appreciated him and his stand for the truth. You may not have ever told him, but I'm telling him now. I appreciate you, Brother Herb. This morning, let us go to Colossians chapter 1. Back in December, I did a couple of these verses on Paul's prayer that he started in this first chapter. And we looked at eight things that he told Christians to pray about in verses 9 and 10. And to lead us up to that, just let us read up to that point. Paul's the writer. Verse 2, it says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. He's writing to the church at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto you your love in the Spirit. And then he says in verse 9 and 10, beginning his prayer, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, as I mentioned, there was eight different things here that Paul was praying uh, for these brethren uh, for. And it's something, these eight things we can pray for uh, to even today, we need to be praying for these things. It's, uh, it's, it was good for them and all down through the generations. It's still good. Still good for us. Now, verse 11, we want to focus on. He continues right on with his prayer. He said, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, In verse 1, he teaches Christians to pray that we will be strengthened with all might. We need that, folks. We need it bad. The, the big problem in this life, folks, is not usually in knowing what to do. It's usually having enough faith and enough determination and desire in ourselves to do it. We need to, as my mother would say, get it done. And we know James chapter 4, verse 17. What does he tell us that? For him to know good and doeth it not, to him is sin. So usually it's not in us not knowing what to do, it's getting it done. It's doing it. It's doing it. We just, we just fall short sometimes in doing that. God not only tells Christians what his will is. You can read all through the Bible what his will is. But not only does he tell us what his will is, 
But God in the New Testament strengthens faithful Christians so that they'll be able to do what he wants us to do, what we need to be doing. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly. Those are strong words, exceedingly abundantly. They didn't have to use those words, but they have meaning. Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That's some, uh, that's some strong, that's a strong verse. Strong verse. He teaches us that he can do all things even above what we can ask and what we can even think of. But there's an obedient faith that comes along with that. We hear people praying in the world that have no business praying. There's a time to stop praying. And these folks have no business to be praying. They just need to stop. God doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner. That is a habitual sinner, those that don't live for him. I believe that's John chapter 9, verse 35, if I ain't mistaken. Now, from Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, and Ephesians 3, 20, that we just read, Paul teaches Christians that they should pray for God's strength and might, and that we can expect our prayers and even more of what we ask or even more of what we think to come powerfully to us. To come powerfully to us. Paul is teaching that if we don't get done what God wants us to do, what God wants us to get done with, accomplish, yeah, I told y'all I'm every English teacher's nightmare. I don't know big words. But if we don't get things done that God wants us to accomplish, Paul's saying it ain't God's fault. And that only leaves yourself. If I don't get it done, it's my fault. It's not Jerry's fault. God's strength and his might is always stronger than the devil. The devil only has the power that you give him. He don't have any more. You give him power and he'll take it. But God's strength and power is always, always stronger. Secondly, in verse 11 of chapter 1 of Colossians, it teaches Christians that they should pray that God's strength and might should be for provided for us according to God's glorious might. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul, and we know that Ephesians and Colossians, you know, are just like that in a lot of, a lot of things. But, you know, the same man wrote it. He had the same thoughts. But he has a similar prayer for Christians at Ephesus. Uh, middle part of verse 18 says that you may know. Then he goes into verse 19. And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power toward us who believe? Now that believe encompasses the whole of the gospel. It's not just belief alone. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ. Now listen to this which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that he used when he raised Christ. The first verse, uh, the first part of verse 19 says, and what is the exceedingly greatness? He didn't have to use exceedingly, but they did means something of his power to usward who believe now many of you probably know the Greek word that we get uh, uh, for power and what word we get from it it's dynamite dynamite you throw a couple sticks in here and it blow everything up it's got a lot of power 
we get our word dynamite from the Greek word dunamis. Now in the next statements that Paul makes, he tells us what that spiritual dynamite from God actually is for Christians. The second part of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 lets Christians know that this is the power and it's from God and it's made available to us so that we can accomplish the things that God wants us to accomplish according to his to the working of his mighty power now the working here means a divine energy or an operative power the word mighty also means manifested strength strength that's made known as we get on into the prayer as it goes on we see and able to learn of many ways that God's mighty power is made known for Christians. Look at verse 20, Ephesians 1. It tells us that God wants Christians to know, look at this, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to his faithful children. God still has that power. He's not lost any of his power. As we said this morning, he's still in control. He's still going to take care of things. He works things out in his own time. But he wants us to know that that same power, which he worked in Christ, is available to us when he raised him from the dead. Now, folks, that uh, resurrection, that is the act above all others and beyond all others that shows us the unlimited power and the ability of God to always do what he promises to do for his children. He made Abraham, we've been studying about Abraham several weeks. He made Abraham promises and every one of them was fulfilled. Regardless of what Abraham did, he fulfilled every promise that he promised Abraham. Why? Because Abraham had an obedient faith and he used it. Now looking back at Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, the words glorious power means basically the same as mighty power and the exceedingly greatness of his power that we just went over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. We have the same thing. Christians, faithful Christians. You know, there's faithful Christians and there are erring Christians. Faithful Christians needs to pray that they keep fresh in their minds at all times that just as God, God's power, raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that it's waiting on us and we have access to it. So when we strive to bear fruit, we can do it. And I say strive, diligently try to bear fruit. Christians will be the winner. They'll be victorious if we will keep faithful to God. If we will go to God's word, study God's word, and appeal to God in prayer as he asks us to. We will be the winners. No matter what we have to face in this world. Thirdly, Colossians 1.11 tells, uh, teaches that Christians needs to pray for patience. They pray for patience as a fruit of their faithfulness in prayer. Now patience means a steadfast endurance <laughs> whereby we can 
the Christian can is able to keep on doing that regardless of what he's having to face. You know, faithfulness to me means being faithful to God even when you're staring temptation in the face. You're still faithful. You still do the will of God. That's faithfulness. And patience, this is a patience. It's, it's an endurance. Uh, you endure. Uh, the Greek word for this English word, patience, don't tell us to go when somebody starts in on us about our faith or whatever or giving us a hard time or we're going through hard times to go crawl up in the corner and stick our head between our knees and, and cry and just put up with it. That's not the kind of patient that this Greek word means. It means that we struggle to keep going forward. And when I, when I was studying on this, I, I thought of a boy I grew up with. His name was Sammy McGilvery. He was probably one of the finest football players that this country ever seen. He didn't go on to pay, play pro ball because he couldn't go to college and stuff like that. And uh, Coach Barry Bryant even come talk to him. A little boy from Russell, Arkansas. But this old boy, when he, if he had got a hold of that ball, or if he was tackling or whatever, but if he was running with that ball, and two or three got on top of him, did he just fall down and quit? No. What he had was that goal line focused on his, in his eyes, and he'd carry two or three of them until they finally could get him down on the ground, if they could. Struggling on, that's the kind of patience we got to have. Struggle on, no matter what. Sometimes it's hard to do. I fail many times. God has forgiven me. But we need to understand that this patience not only means the ability to bear things, but the ability in bearing them to turn them into a victory. Turn them into a victory. It's a conquering patience. This kind of patience is the ability to be triumphant over anything that this old world can throw at you. In James chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, it says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke, spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance or the patience of Job and seen the end intended for the, by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now here, he's teaching that Christians need to look back at the patience of the old brethren. We know that the Old Testament is for our learning. We learn that in, in God's Word. And we need to look at the patience that these people had, even Job. Look what Job went through. They dealt with their sufferings, with their persecutions, with their discouragements. They, they put up with it, and they went on, and they were victorious. They went on to victory. When things seem to be unbearable for Christians, we need to pray for patience. Patience from God to help us to demonstrate the kind of patience that Paul and James was talking about here. You know, something that'll keep us going. Patience to keep up the struggle. Just like old Sammy had the patience. He just kept on going. Just kept on going. Nothing was going to stop him as long as he was able to stay on his two feet. And that's what we need to be doing. Fourthly, Colossians 1.11 teaches Christians to pray that they should be long-suffering. I have a problem with that too, with patience and long-suffering. But sometimes this is long-suffering spoken of as patience in God's Word. 
in the English language, but there is a technical difference in the words, in the two words, in the Greek and in the English. Long suffering in the Greek, uh, for its basic meaning, is being patient with people. You know, one, one brother, I read that what he said about long suffering, he kind of described it this way. It's the quality of mind and heart which enables us to cope with people in such a way that their unpleasantness and malice and cruelty will never drive us to bitterness. That their unwillingness to learn will never drive us to despair. And their foolishness will never drive us to irritation. And that their unlovingness will never alter our love. That's, a, that's really a good, good statement. Long suffering is the makeup of your character that lets you never lose patience with or belief in or hope for other people. Like I said, I have a, I have a problem with that. I get, I get irritated at people sometimes when they know to do good and don't. I get irritated. I get irritated with myself. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 31, or 41, we have a good example. We all know of Barnabas, John Mark, and Paul. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him. Paul didn't want him to go because he had left him in Jerusalem. You can read that story in Acts chapter 13, I believe it is, verse 13, where John left him in Jerusalem. Well, Paul was a little bit mad, and he didn't want nothing to do with John Mark. But it said they even had some bad words between each other. Paul and Barnabas did. But Paul took his guy with him. Barnabas took John Mark, and they left. Departed from one another. And later on, this long suffering that Barnabas had paid off for John Mark. Oh, John Mark, he uh, developed a strong character, didn't he? We know that years later, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, verses 4, 9 through 11, he asked that Mark be sent brought with him and, and so he could use him in his ministry. So we see that John Mark spiritually grew in his faith. Another thing that shows us that being long-suffering uh, with John Mark is that John Mark is called Mark is the one who wrote the gospel. He wrote the gospel account of Jesus Christ. So each and every one of us as Christians need to pray that God will help us with our long suffering so that we can make a positive impression on other people. We need to pray that God can help us not to give up on people too quick. Sometimes people are hard-headed. And sometimes we walk off. Well, there comes a time that you do. But we're told that there's other people that needs teaching. And if these people are not going to accept it, shake the dust off your feet and go somewhere else. There's other people wanting to obey the gospel. Our long suffering, our willingness to work with others and help them develop might strengthen someone like Barnabas strengthened Mark. Lastly, this morning, verse 11 teaches Christians that they should pray for joy. You know, joy can come to us as faithful Christians no matter what situation we're in. 
One, one reason it can come to us is knowing that we're living and doing the will of God the way we should. We're living right in the sight of God. That's joy. Folks, that's joy. In Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 42, we all know the story. We have the apostles that have been beat. They've been told, don't you preach no more. These Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, they agreed with Gamaliel. Gamaliel's the one that Paul sat at his feet and learned from. He was the head of the Sanhedrin. But as they was beat and threatened, they went on their way, counting themselves worthy, it says, to suffer the shame for his sake, for his name. And daily in the temple, they didn't stop preaching. It says, and in every house, they didn't cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They didn't stop. Now we find in Acts chapter 16, another story that we're probably all familiar with. We have Paul and Silas that has been uh, thrown into prison. Been told to, they've been beaten. They told the old guard not to, to take close watch on them. We know that they was thrown into the inner prison because if they had got out, that old guard would have got in trouble. Now what do we find at midnight Paul and Silas doing? They were singing hymns and they was praying to God. They wasn't afraid. They wasn't afraid for their life. And it says that the prisoners was listening to them. There you go. You don't ever know. You don't ever know who's watching you, who's looking at you, who's listening to you. Now, some 10 years later, after Paul was in prison in Philippi, Paul writes the letter to his brethren at Philippi. In Philippians 4, in verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Paul been through a lot of things. If you notice in one of the letters that he wrote to the Corinthians, he, he mentioned all the stuff that he'd been through. Never once did he ever bat an eye when it comes to preaching the gospel. The Christian joy is joy in any circumstance. And another brother told me this one time that it's really important to understand that joy, if joy is not rooted in the soil of suffering, let me see if I can get it right, it'll turn out to be a shallow type of joy and it'll be gone. Hard times make you stronger. It's easy for people to be joyful when times are going good, when things are good. Got all I want, you know, got plenty of food, everything going well. Got the work caught up around the house, man, I'm doing good. But genuine Christian joy is something that the shadows of life, whatever comes about in this life, cannot take away from a faithful Christian. And summing this lesson up, the Christian prayer should be like this, folks. Make me, Lord, patient and victorious over every circumstance. Make me long-suffering with every person. And give me the joy which no circumstance, nothing in this world, will ever take away from me. I appreciate you folks listening this morning. There might be some this morning that have obeyed the gospel, but they've fallen short. It's bothering them. And it will, a Christian. It'll bother you. 
And if you need the prayers of the brethren, if you let it be known, we will be more than happy to pray with you and pray for you. Or some may not have obeyed the gospel yet. The Lord gives us a simple way to have salvation. First of all, we have to hear the word. We have to believe. We have to have that faith. We have to repent of our sins. That don't just mean to tell God you're sorry. When you repent, you make a change. You make a change. Then we confess Jesus as the Son of God, as many did in the first century. And then we are baptized in water. We are fully submerged. Every last little piece of us is submerged in water. That's where we come in contact with the blood of our Lord and Savior that hanged on that cross for us. That's the only place we come in contact with. And then the Lord tells us to be faithful. Live a faithful life. You know, those folks, when he told those folks in, at Smyrna Church, that in Revelation 2.10, those people were in danger of their lives. It don't just mean be faithful as long as you live, even if it means your death, folks. Even somebody holds a gun to your head and say, get God out of your mind. Boy, I'm going to blow it out. Say, blow it out. That's what it means. Be faithful even if it means your death. If there's anyone here this morning, we beg and plead with you to come as we stand and sing the song. Heart the gentle voice of Jesus calling.